right. After that ab absolutely beautiful prelude, it's time to sing. Our opening hymn this morning is Hope of the World, number 178. Please rise if able. of great compassion speak to our people hearts by conflict rent save us thy people from consuming passion who by our own false hopes Join with me in the call to worship found in your bulletins. I believe this is based on Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my earnest asking. My soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. You join me in the unison prayer. 
God of all, you sent your Son to lead us in the ways of righteousness. May we continue to seek Christ as our example through the means of the Holy Spirit and Scripture. Today, as we gather to hear your word, we ask that you open our hearts, minds, and lives to the Scripture messages shared with us this morning. Our Old Testament reading comes from 2 Samuel 18 and its various verses. The king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So when the army went out to the field against Israel and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim, the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great. On that day, 20,000 men. And the battle spread over the face of all in the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. He was riding on his mule, and the mule went under uh, thick branches of oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth, caught by his head. The mule underneath him went on. Now 15. Ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Verses 31 to 33. A Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Good tidings for my lord the king. For the Lord has vindicated you on this day delivering you from the power of all of those who rose up against you. And the king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to, you, to do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved, and he went to the chamber over the gate, and he wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, would I have died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Our New Testament reading is from Ephesians 4, 25 to 5, 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors. For we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so to have something to share with others. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. As there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal on that day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness, all wrath, all anger and wrangling and slander, together with malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and give and live in love as Christ has loved us, and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The second hymn this morning 
is O God Who Shaped Creation, and that's on 443. shaped creation at earth's chaotic dawn. Your word of power was spoken, and lo, the dark was gone. You framed us in your image. You brought us into and shed your splendid earth. O God, with pain and anguish, a mother sees her child, embark on dead and pathways, alluring but defined. So to your heart is broken when hate and lust increase, when worlds you birthed and nurtured spurn ways that lead to peace. Although your heart is broken, Gospel reading. It's from John 6, 35, and then 41 to 51. Jesus said to them, 
I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they were saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say now, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word of God for the people of God. We have a time of special music now. We just put that in there. For that. That was a special treat to hear that. All right.
in pretty strict adherence to the revised common lectionary, I am somewhat satisfied usually with the readings um, each week. Now, if you're relatively low church and the word lectionary is semi-new to you, I can just briefly explain. It's a collection of, collection of readings from the Bible, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament letters, one from the Gospels, and one from the Psalms. And every week, they roll around, and um, pastors, usually Catholics, also Protestants, preach from them. Um, if you're Episcopalian, you might read from your um, Book of Common Prayer, and they have a daily lectionary. I follow the weekly lectionary online. But, so we're in year B, there's a three-year cycle, A, B, and C, and those roll around every year. So, I think it's appropriate, I tend to follow the lectionary, because I, I like the diversity of readings. I like that I'm forced to preach from the Old Testament, and from the New Testament letters, and from the Gospel, and sometimes from the Psalms. I think it's a good smattering of diversity to share in our congregations. But the Bible is a diverse book. It has a lot of genres in it. And um, sometimes you have to read the Bible with that in one hand and the commentary in the other to really get the meaning of what's being said. However, you'll notice something a little funny. When I read the second Samuel reading this morning, it was 2 Samuel 18, I read 5 through 9, I skipped a few, went to 15, I skipped some more, <laughs> and I went to 31 to 33. You might be thinking, no, why does she do that? My answer is the lectionary does that. <laughs> you say, no, but why does the lectionary do that? And really, it's kind of a simple answer. They want to get the reading down as short as possible, so we aren't sitting here all day and um, still get the point of what they were trying to get across. Now, don't get me wrong, I probably could stand up here and read Bible stories for the entire hour and be just as happy, but I won't do that to us. <laughs> so, I want to go into this um, second Samuel reading a little bit. I was a little disappointed. Um, last week, if you remember, it's kind of asking a lot to remember back a week ago, but we read from 2 Samuel 12. And so this week, if you're looking down, you're thinking it's 2 Samuel 18. We missed six chapters. So that's something I kind of mourn about the lectionary, is it tends to jump around quite a bit. So I've decided for this sermon, I want us to go back over those 12 chapters that we missed, just so you can get the story of David a bit more complete. If you remember last week, we talked a little bit about David and Bathsheba. And now we're jumping into something about Absalom. Who is Absalom? A lot of you know the answer already, but if you don't, we're going to find out. <laughs> so I'll give us the light version, but it's not actually light version because the material is really dense. So I'll give you the condensed version. And as you listen um, to my creative retelling of these past six chapters, try and keep track of who is the good guy and who's the bad guy? See if you can do that. So, David and Bathsheba are married. That was last week or the week before. I'm getting things mixed up here. But that's only after David kills Bathsheba's husband, if you remember that. He has him murdered. So, God is angry, and David's upset because God's angry at him. <laughs> and God warns David, your son is not going to live. Your son by Bathsheba is not going to live. David mourned the loss of his son, and then he continues on to have more children with Bathsheba, such as Solomon. So we get into the story of Solomon next week and the week after. But keep in mind, David has a lot of kids. Bathsheba was not his only wife. He had 10 concubines. So David has a lot of children. <laughs> And our story picks up from chapter 12 into 13 with um, David's kids reaching puberty. One of the children becomes, uh, it's not very polite, but coveting his half-sister. And that's not uncommon in Bible stories, especially in the Old Testament. 
but his name is Amnon. And Amnon tricks his half-sister Tamar into, into his room, and he ends up raping her. It's a horrible story. He decides that he cannot stand her after that, and he casts her off and sends her out. And so now she's defiled, and she lives this kind of a very poor existence. But Amnon's half-brother, brother from another mother there, Absalom, he sees what Amnon has done to Tamar and says, that's wrong. I'm going to take her in and care for her. So Absalom takes in Tamar, but unfortunately he tells her, one, don't enact revenge, and two, don't tell anyone what happened to you. So this poor woman has to live the rest of her life with this horrible secret. Years later, a couple of years later, Absalom, this is the one who took Tamar in, he requests the company of his dad on a hunting trip. He says, David, dad, let's go on a hunting trip together. And David says, I'm the king. I can't just go right now. I'm sorry, I have to send someone else. And Absalom says, hmm, what about Amnon? which is his brother who had done that horrible thing. And David, not knowing about that, says, you want your brother to go with you? You don't even know him. And he says, yeah, Amnon can come along. So David sends Absalom and Amnon on a hunting trip. And Absalom murders Amnon. He takes revenge for what Amnon did to his sister. So then Absalom, after murdering his brother, <laughs> says, I can't go back to my dad. And he runs away. He runs to a relative's place on the coast, and he stays there. And he lives a pretty happy life. It talks about him growing out his beautiful hair, and he has a wife and children, and he lives a really good life at his, um, I think it was an uncle's house. And David is pretty upset. He says, I, I don't want my sons gone. He, he was pleased to know that only one son died, but he was hurt that the son didn't come back and apologize for this. So Absalom is away for a long time. But out of the blue, David's chief advisor, his name is Joab, he's a political advisor, he comes up with a plan to try and convince David that, hey, your son Absalom should come back. You should try and welcome him back and get him to stay in the city again. He's your oldest son. It might be good to have him back. And David says, no, nobody will forgive me, not even God. So Joab decides to take matters into his own hand. He hires a woman. She's a nameless woman. It bothers me that she doesn't have a name, but she's called the wise woman from Tekoa. And he hires her to come in and convince David through acting and a metaphorical story that Absalom should come back to Israel. So she gets creative and she convinces David and through a metaphorical story, allow your son to come back. And after a while, David is nodding to this, and he says, Joab sent you, didn't he? <laughs> and the woman says, yes. <laughs> and so David thinks about this, and he decides to restore Absalom to his kingdom. If you end there, that's a pretty happy story, even though it's very odd and very sad in some places. But that's not where it ends, unfortunately. All is not well in the kingdom we start to believe that maybe Joab was, he knew something more than the reader knew. He wanted Absalom close by so he could keep an eye on him. And rightly so. David's son Absalom starts sowing seeds of doubt in the community. He was displeased about the way his dad treated the poor. He says, my dad David, he Kings act as a judge in that time, so the kings would go into the gates and they'd listen to people and try and mediate. He says, my dad, David, is not a good judge for these people. I, Absalom, could be a much better judge than my father, David. He starts convincing people who are down on their luck that he would be a much better king than David. Absalom promises the people that it would be better for everyone if David was kicked out of the kingdom and Absalom could rule a little early. And soon, Absalom finds himself being supported by a lot of people. And not only just the citizens, but one of David's chief advisors, another A name, I'm sorry, but Ahithophel. 
Nehitophel is coincidentally said to be Bathsheba's grand grandfather. So there might be some rivalry there and some bitter feelings. But Ahithophel is a wise and respected man. He says, I'll, I'll advise you, Absalom. If you want to be king, I'll be your advisor. And David finally picks up on this and has to flee for his life. The people really wanted a new king. They said, David, I don't care what God said to you. We want you out. And he leaves sorrowfully. And he leaves with a lot of people. He ends up, it's kind of a cool scene, he's leaving and people just keep joining him and leaving with him because they were so well loved by certain people. I would say, read that passage, I think it might be 14, um, if you want to get misty eyes while you're reading, it's very bittersweet. A lot of people show loyalty to David, um, even mercenaries. There was that one eye name that I read that probably just flew over your head, but it was like Ittai or Ishtai or something like that. And that was a mercenary ruler and to think that even people who weren't paid by David but they lived by money and sword that they would follow David out of the kingdom because they liked him that much the priests go with David the ark of the covenant goes with David and David turns around after a while and says no priests go back go back to the city the ark does not belong with me the ark belongs in the city you need to go back so the priests take the ark of the covenant even and take that back to Jerusalem. David does say, if the Lord wants me to see it again, he will restore me to my kingdom. Ahithophel now, this is the advisor to Absalom. He tells Absalom, it's not good enough that David just left. You need to go finish the job. <laughs> so Absalom says, okay, I'll take your word for it. And Ahithophel says, don't go by yourself, though. Don't bring an army with you. You stay here with the people. You send out an army to kill David. But luckily for David, some of his friends followed David out of the kingdom and said, we're going to stick with you, David. David says, no, nope, you're just going to slow me down. You go back to the kingdom. And they said, well, we're going to serve as spies for you. Then if we go back, he's like, all right, <laughs> you can't stay with me. So the spies go back. And one of David's friends convinces Absalom. He says, don't, don't listen to Ahithophel. He says, you are the king of Israel now. You need to go and lead your men into battle. You, you lead those Israelites to fight David. You show them who's boss. And Absalom says, yeah, I'll do that. I'm going to lead them. So Absalom is convinced by David's friends. <laughs> and so David's friends, who are now spies, run back to Judah, run back to David and say, your son's coming. <laughs> so people are warned. They know what's going to happen. They know there's going to be a battle, brother against brother. Ahithophel, unfortunately, is sensing that the end is near. He knew that his advice was not taken. He knew that Absalom would probably not survive. And so Ahithophel does something a little odd. He goes back to a homeland and he hangs himself. He kills himself because he knows that the end is near. As David's men prepare for battle, David is convinced by them, don't go into battle. They said, you have a target on your back. Don't go into battle. You stay here. We'll fight for you. We'll send someone to tell you when it's over. And David reluctantly agrees, and he says, just don't kill Absalom. Do not kill my son. I'll tell you throughout this whole process of leaving home, David has shown an impeccable amount of mercy and repentance. And this is probably one of the times where I consider David wise. David is very wise in these, in these chapters. And he was welcomed into Judah. He was celebrated by Judah. They didn't want him to leave and go back. They said, you can be our king. We like you here. <laughs> so now the battle is taking place. And it's taking place in the wilderness, in the woods. And in that time, there would have been woods there. Um, there have been lions and bears, and there have been a lot of trees. <laughs> so many Israelites, unfortunately, die. The woods are very rough. And as fate would have it, this is where our story picks up, Absalom is riding through these woods, and he gets his head caught in a branch. And you think that's a little funny, and it's like a comic skit that you've seen on TV before, but it doesn't have a very happy ending, so... He's stuck in this branch and the donkey just keeps going. It doesn't know anything else, just keeps going. So he's stuck dangling there, it said between heaven and earth. 
And there's an interesting scene. It's Joab's men, they call him David's men there, but it's, it's Joab's men, spot Absalom and say, isn't that the guy we're looking for? <laughs> and so they're all standing there with their arms crossed, they're looking at him thinking, what should we do? He's just fallen into our hands here. We could just take him and kill him, even though David told us not to. We could get rid of him right now. So there's this long scene of them deciding what to do. And finally, Joab is like looking at his folks and he says, all right. He just goes over and takes a couple of spears and knocks Absalom off the tree. He doesn't kill him. He knocks him off the tree onto the ground. He's tired of seeing dangling there. But Joab's men take that as a sign of aggression and come over and they kill Absalom. So Joab sees this and says, that's not tell David yet. But he needs to send a servant to tell David that the battle is over. So a volunteer, uh, who's also loyal to David, says, send me, send me. And Joab's like, I already sent a servant. You don't need to go. And this guy's like, I insist. I have to go tell David. So he sends him as well. David's friend outruns the servant, goes to David and says, David, the battle's over. We won. And David says, OK, how's Absalom? And the guy says, oh, I don't know. So the servant gets there and says, David, the battle is won. And David says, OK, how's my son? And the servant says something akin to, the threat has been neutralized. And now David, who understands what he feared to be the case, weeps. He says, would I have died instead of you, Absalom, oh, my son? my son. So that's where our story ends for today. It's not a very happy ending. And now I have to ask, how successful were you in keeping track of who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? It seems to completely flip upside down every other page. <laughs> so what if I told you I left out a whole section on David getting pelted with rocks by people who were still mad that he was king because they said, Saul was our king, you're not our king. There was a whole section where David was getting hit and pelted and he just kept going. He just said, let them be angry. People said, we could cut off their heads. And they said, nope, they're righteously mad. We let them do their thing. So what you'll pick up on is there's rarely ever any black and white answers in the Bible. And there really is Barely ever any black and white answers in life that we're dealing with. Despite what media and culture tell us, they say there's always good guys and there's always bad guys and you gotta pick a side. I think you'll find there's rarely ever a clear cut example of good and bad in the real world. Comic book characters can only go so far before you start to say that's not how it is. Surely we can think of good people, and surely we can think of bad people, but they can't be all good and they can't be all bad. It's just not the truth. There are people who do evil things. There are dictators who murder for political gain. But if you remember, this is after World War II, so I don't know how many of us were around, but the court case of Eichmann and Arendt, we know that there's a banality of evil. There is always some gray area. Eichmann, who is um, a hiree of Hitler, helped organize the murder of thousands of people. And when he was put on trial, he claims that he morally had a problem with what he was doing. He says I, he couldn't stand killing people. He says, that's why I got transferred away. So you really shouldn't kill me because I didn't like what I was doing. And the court is sitting there looking at him. <laughs> He says, I, I had a problem with what I was doing, but I loved my family. I'm a good person. I loved my family. Of course, he didn't win his case. But it's ever so important that we hold one another accountable. We should not seek revenge, but we must always seek righteousness. I am saying this because it was in the Ephesians passage, but be angry. I, be angry angry at the evil in the world. It tries to get us to ignore the love of Christ, to ignore the Christ we see in others. 
Be angry at those injustices. Don't let them just sit there and win. Do your best to help in whatever way that you can. The treatment of Tamar in this story was wrong. The treatment of David, when he, what he did to Bathsheba, that was wrong. And despite wanting to help his country, Absalom was wrong for what he did. So be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. In the Ephesians reading, do what's useful for building up. Hold each other accountable. And as David did, he did this well at least, learn to forgive. Be kind to one another. Let yourself be tender-hearted. Allow yourself to mourn. Mourn even for those who have done something wrong. Absalom, my son, my son. And for our benefit, we were promised the bread of life, the living bread that came down out of love for us. And we, the family, we, the children of that, must reflect what we know in our hearts to be true, even in those gray areas. This time, would you join me in the pastoral prayer found in your bulletin, please? In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Bishop Mark Webb, D.S. Mike Whedon, and all bishops and ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord. Your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray, we pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Would you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our closing hymn this morning is O oh Master, Let Me Walk With Thee, and that's on 430. Yeah.
small list of announcements here. Um, but first, I have a concern that I just got now. Um, it's about Effa. So she has an aggressive form of breast cancer, and the drainage tube was removed. Um, her second doctor's appointment is soon, and chemo for her starts on September 2nd. So she has radiation after that. So continue your prayers for Effa as she is um, battling at this at the moment. And I'm sure she would appreciate your call. So. And I also have a thank you card, kind of a cool one here. Um, it's from Urbana Food Bank. It says, Kathy and others, I love what you made and sent for our food bank families. Thank you so much. Blessings to all of you, Joe. So we got a nice thank you note there. Couple more things. We're starting coffee hour. Yay! <laughs> so feel free to stick around after the service today. It's August 8th, right? Yeah. Yep. So feel free to stick around after the service. And if you want to help volunteer, we're going to need volunteers for coffee hour. Contact Millie, and she will set you straight and get you into a schedule. So um, please feel free to sign up for that. Also, make sure to sign up for small group introductory meetings with me. I would love to meet you all and. Uh, oh, hey, there's a sign-up sheet. Tom has it there. <laughs> okay, on the piano. Please sign up for that so I get to meet you all in a more um, personal basis there. And also, I have a note from Trish. Saturday at 2 p.m. is Evan Duncan's funeral, uh, Evelyn Duncan's funeral. It's going to be here. Um, Trish is doing it per their request. So it's um, feel free to come if you have time. 2 p.m. on Saturday for Evelyn Duncan. Anything else? Any other announcements? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So we, Emma Young there turned 16 on August 5th. So. That's pretty cool. Anyone else? Okay. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>